Let us then turn to one more model of the spiritual journey to complete the other two that we've presented so far. We presented uh, over here the evolutionary model, which is completed in this diagram on the left side with its additional higher states of consciousness. This uh, chain of being is now open to each human person in view of the fact that the human family has finally arrived at this full self-reflective self-consciousness and personhood which involves the use of, of reason. This is the door into the higher states of consciousness. So that the great <laughs> issue of, of the human family at this time is to become fully human, to develop what personhood really means, which is the capacity to relate to more and more of reality, honestly, with compassion and, and love. And so the, the values of, of belonging, of, of cooperation and harmony rather than competition, are now the values that, uh, that will assist in this process of bringing the whole human family into its, into its full uh, mental egoic consciousness that was initiated in the low mental egoic period, maybe 3000 BC, which came into uh, its middle and full flowering about 1000 BC, and, and which is now coming perhaps to its high peak of, of self-consciousness manifested by the intense psychological age in which we are living. This central diagram is a, a view of the faculties and relationships of human nature as far as it can be discovered philosophically. And, and this diagram is a, is a kind of, of expression largely of the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas, which predates uh, uh, our evolutionary worldview and which expressed the static worldview that was characteristic of the high Middle Ages. It represents a, a magnificent evaluation of human nature for its time, but uh, obviously it has to be updated and brought into dialogue with the other uh, developments in human knowledge, especially through the physical sciences and, uh, and the uh, psychological, sociological sciences that have developed in the last century or so. So, so in addition to our, our chain of being, which is the ideal evolution of the human family and the ideal evolution of an individual human being who recapitulates, as we saw, in, in ourselves the development of the whole human family. And, and, and so it's an ideal program that in actual fact fairly rarely is verified in the individual plane and has yet to be verified in the average human uh, consciousness across the board of humanity. In actual fact, as we saw, most of us are still struggling to become human be and are hindered from doing so by our emotional programs and over-identification with our group. Now, in our diagram on the uh, far right here, we, we saw a model of the existential way in which human life is actually experienced. And this involved the uh, study and the, of, of all the difficulties that our emotional programming and our over-identification uh, with the, uh, our group or parents has caused so that the, the existential model is the way it actually is, and these two models are, are simply ideal models of the way it's supposed to be, depending on whether you look at human nature from a static point of view or an evolutionary one. 
So that's the value of looking at this philosophical model is simply to identify the powers and faculties of human nature so that we might be able to recognize what they're normally supposed to do when they work properly, even if in actual fact we don't experience them that way. So let me run through this uh, uh, quickly. The human being is a, is a microcosm of the entire uh, created world. In our bodies are, of course, the, the inorganic matter that we eat and, and uh, uh, the constituency of our various cells are, are made up of, of uh, material taken from the earth. And so our material body might be called the, uh, the sub-basement in which this whole superstructure is built. We also have the powers within us of the vegetable uh, world or kingdom, namely the capacity to grow, to nourish ourselves, and to reproduce ourselves. And we might consider that the basement. Then we come to the street floor. Now, the street floor is, is, is the three-dimensional world to which we relate with our senses. And so the first story of this, of this skyscraper, this interior skyscraper, you might say, is the ex five external senses that are indicated here on the diagram by these ears, the door, mouth, I suppose, the nose, and the eyes. Now, I regret that this, this man looks a little bit confused here. <laughs> Possibly because with all this marvelous, these marvelous faculties, he's wondering why they don't work so well. I think. But anyway, he, he, uh, uh, human beings also have the internal senses and emotions which we share with the higher mammals. Now, you'll notice that on the left side of the skyscraper are faculties of knowing or perception. And on the right side are faculties of appetite. So, so these uh, appetitive and faculties of knowing obviously correlate on the various in floors of this model. This model, incidentally, is, is modeled on the interior castle of St. Teresa in some degree. Uh, now, since we don't have castles anymore, it seemed more useful to to, to use a, a, a paradigm from the technological age, a skyscraper. But some people object to that because they, they, to them it suggests a, a hierarchical view of reality that is repugnant to their sense of equality. So if you don't like the diagram this way, just turn it upside down <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it could be looked upon as, as, a as a descent into deeper levels of consciousness. There's no geography in the spiritual journey. Up and down is the same. But we have to visualize it in some, in some way. What, what the point to keep in mind is that we share in, in, in matter, we share in the vegetable life, we share in animal life. And, and this is precisely what we experienced in our eurobaric and typhonic periods in the first few years of childhood when our senses were feeding the brain with material with which to develop our internal senses, and then the typhon, a typhonic level of consciousness brought our, our midbrain into, into action, and, and we were able to, to relate inwardly to the experiences outwardly and to develop the body-self distinction from the rest of, of nature and our previous immersion in it. So all, all knowledge in St. Thomas's uh, point of view comes through the external senses. Hence, this is called Main Street here because that's where the action is, so to speak, or where it, rather it begins. Now, let's take a look at these internal senses just to identify them. The, the, the central sense is that faculty that unites multiple experiences or stimuli coming from the external senses. Thus, I see this round object which tastes kind of bitter, and it has a yellow uh, shell, and it's just so big, and uh, it looks appetizing, and, and it's the central sense that, that says, without 
going through that process, it's a lemon. Okay. <laughs> or, or similarly, it gives you a unit experience made up of a number of stimuli. Now, when <coughs> we, re we also have a sense memory which recalls past units of experience, past experience, and an imagination which creates out of past experience stored in the memory bank, our vast com computerized memory bank there in our brain, which stores out of that store of images, it creates new images, and, and, and its creative abilities are, are fantastic. Uh, the cogitative sense uh, corresponds to that uh, to instinct in animals, but the human mammal uh, has the least amount of instincts, it would seem, and is the most helpless when it emerges into life, and hence it's designed to, to be, uh, to find when it arrives in this world, the kind of welcome and love which, which it desperately needs. I remember uh, a group, uh, a family, uh, telling me that this, uh, they, about the birth of their uh, youngest child. Uh, they had been in family life and had, uh, had, had uh, done a lot of study into parenting and so on. So they decided to have a reception committee when the child was born. So all the family were gathered together and assisting at this birth. And, and, and everybody was wide awake, including the mother. And, and when baby were finally was born, there was applause. There was a great shout of welcome. And the baby opened his eyes and looked around and smiled. <laughs> he was so pleased <laughs> to find this reception. And I'm told that this child is, is as exceptionally intelligent and well-adjusted. So, so if we could give children upon their entrance in the world the kind of reception that Imagine yourself if you came from this safe place into this mysterious world, how you would feel. We've forgotten how we felt, but it seems that we had feeling. So anyway, this, this, this capacity of, 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 of evaluating sense experience is what we mean by the cogitative sense. In other words, it, it's like those... Uh, uh, to, to use another image, those children who felt deprived of the good things of life, such as uh, uh, they were surrounded by terror or they were neglected, well, they hesitate then with their emotions uh, to accept the adventure of life. Even though their biological urge for survival keeps them going, there's not a love of life. This is, is not a, a rational judgment about experience. It's the emotional judgment. And this is crucial for, for the whole development of the false self system, which has to find ways of coping with negative experiences or experiences perceived by the child as threatening. Now, on the, also on the level of our internal uh, senses are the emotions which correspond with the, what the information, the central sense, memory, imagination, and cogitative sense are registering. And so there are two sets of emotions. One is the simple pleasure appetite which re reacts spontaneously with an attraction for what is perceived as good and with an aversion for what is perceived as harmful for the organism. And, uh, and when that uh, when either the perceived object, good or bad, is, is absent, it experiences desire or aversion. If it's present, it experiences joy or sorrow. Now, the utility appetite, or the emergency appetite, is a little more complex. It involves the pursuit of goods that are difficult to obtain, uh, or the avoidance of, of, of perceived evils that are difficult to avoid. And, and so this involves a, a much deeper engagement of the personality and the emotional life. And, and hence, if, if these emotions are constantly <laughs> being activated, then the body reacts to this overstimulation with various forms of dis-ease.
That is to say, it doesn't feel so good because the brain is now adjusting itself, the brain cells, to, uh, to an abnormal situation. Because the normal situation for a human being is, is to experience the, the simpler emotions. This is like, you know, being on 24-hour duty or something in a hospital. There's always a siren going off or a phone ringing, and you have to respond. Well, uh, too much of that is not good balance of life. And in the technological culture, uh, there's be research going on uh, now to the effect that, that most of us, because of the noise, the stress, the anxiety, and the technological character of modern life, our failure to enjoy the relaxing experiences of, of nature for a great many, a large part of the population, that there's almost a, 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 a constant uh, call on the utility emotions resulting when we try to relax in withdrawal symptoms of various levels of intensity. Uh, in regard to these uh, different uh, perceptions, either good or evil, when the difficult good is still available, we experience hope. When it appears to be no longer available, one, one experiences despair or discouragement. And, and, and uh, when this has, these have developed, as we showed in our, in our diagram about what happens when the uh, energy centers are frustrated, this the, the apathy is, is what happens when despair becomes habitual or frequent. One simply kind of has the emotional withdrawal from life, friends, duties, commitments. It's, it's a kind of paralyzing experience. On the other hand, when, the, when, when an evil is, is perceived and not yet present, we can react in two ways, either by courage, which takes on the difficulty, or by fear, which, which experiences the difficulty as an impending evil that is gradually descending upon one and which calls for some kind of speedy reaction. And finally, anger, the evil descends upon you and becomes present, and there's usually the inclination of rage together with some a tendency to revenge. Now, uh, in, in repression, what seems to happen is that one of the emotions in the stronger utility appetite represses an emotion in the pleasure appetite, so that it never uh, is able to get beyond the emotional level to a judgment of reason. For instance, if one is afraid of showing anger and, and in the milieu is never allowed to show emotion, then you might repress it. In World War I, it was said, it was found that many of the British Tommies were having psychotic episodes in the trenches. Well, they were just so scared with these mortars dropping in all the time that they wanted to, to shout. But according to their military training and their cultural conditioning, a Tommy or an Englishman was never supposed to show any emotions, especially fear. So when they taught these people to, to reveal or to manifest or express fear, they felt a lot better. Until then, they were more or less ill. They had to be sent home to a hospital, many of them. Uh, so uh, it, so any emotion that is regarded as unacceptable because of cultural reasons or religious education may be uh, repressed by fear or anger or one of the other stronger emotions. And, and this means that, it, that it's rumbling around somewhere in our emotional life and in our, in our bodies and, and has simply been displaced and will eventually emerge in some form of, of ill health or bizarre activity. Now, reason uh, begins to function uh, at a, uh, between the ages of four and seven, although it's not abstract reasoning. It's a kind of logical reasoning, and it's used in the service of our programs uh, for happiness or to avoid unhappiness. 
And this is also the period when the mythical membership uh, period begins, where we absorb unquestioningly the values and demands or commands of, of parents or other authority figures. Uh, at seven, the age of reason begins to, to function uh, more, and, and the possibility of operational logic and thinking logically begins. To think logically, there has to be this subject-object relationship. So that means that the, that the child has developed a full self-identity at this point, not fully rational, but it now recognizes it, it, itself as a mind as well as a body. It's beginning to differentiate its, its intellect from its, its body and, 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 uh, and the environment. Now, the acts of, 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 of reason are these four that are various ways in which the same faculty deals with reality. About 11, abstract thinking seems to, uh, to, to begin to come into function. And, uh, and reason is, is the coming to conclusions from first principles. Understanding is the grasp of, of first principles. There's an intellectual memory bank as well as a sense memory bank. And finally, there is conscience, which is the judgment of reason about what is right or wrong. And that judgment of reason is in, is in constant conflict or dialogue with the cogitative sense, which in modern uh, psychology is, is not quite the same as superego, but their consequences are they're somewhat related because the superego represents the obligation emerging from an emotional judgment rather than a judgment of reason. Hence, it's not true conscience, it's not reliable, but this is where guilt feelings arise and where self-recriminations arise, which are really uh, unreasonable or neurotic. So neurotic guilt is, is, an, is an unintegrated cogitative sense <laughs> into a true, rational conscience. Uh, the will is the faculty, then, that, that goes towards whatever the good of reason presents to it. The will is not <laughs> programmed to any particular good, and, and this consists somewhat its freedom of choice. It always is geared to choose what seems to be good or what is represented as good. But its freedom consists in choosing between goods. Now, you can see that, that we now have really three levels of, of functioning, of knowing, and of, of responding with, with desire. One are sensible objects presented through the external senses. Another are the intellectual goods, such as truth, virtue, honesty, compassion. And a third level, which we'll see in just a moment, is the spiritual good that might be presented either through our intellectual apparatus, our active intellect, or through intuition. Intellect has two aspects. One is active, which reasons. The other is passive, or intuitive, which perceives truth directly without the mediation of reason. And, 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 and to that level also corresponds this innate, innate tendency to desire happiness. The will to God is this innate desire for happiness that is at the root of our, of our search as, as seekers. As, uh, and, and, it, and it speaks to the deepest part of, of human nature, the desire for God and the, and the, and the memory, so to speak, intuitively uh, infused that something is missing in our life and that only God can, can fill it. Remember, in the night of sense, uh, God infuses into us the knowledge that only he can satisfy. And this tends to relativize all the other <laughs> objects that we had hoped would provide us with absolute or infinite happiness. And hence, the ex psychological experience of of, of not finding satisfaction in God or in anything else, such as we had previously enjoyed it. Now, in, at the still point, uh, we do not uh, have a, an immediate uh, conscious experience of it. 
And in fact, even this level is not immediately evident to us, except occasionally, without some discipline to cultivate it. Now, what are we doing in centering prayer? For the period of centering prayer, we're closing down everything in our perceptive and reactive, our, our knowledge and appetitive faculties, from here on down, in order to open ourselves to the intuitive level through our passive intellect and to God through this, this openness to happiness of an unbounded kind. Now, as we wait, <laughs> the divine action may bring us from time to time into the still point, which mystics also call the apex or peak of the spirit. And, and it's that place in which our, our, our person, having been developed now to the full mythical membership level, is reinserted, so to speak, or, or joined to the universal mind or the cosmos and, or what we would express in the Christian religion as our Christ nature, or again, as our true self. And, and, and this experience, uh, as, as it in, uh, reincorporates us into, into the uh, unity with all reality, brings about the corresponding awareness or intuitive grasp of the oneness <laughs> of the human family, and indeed, oneness with all reality. And, and beyond that is what is, is, is that source from which we come, the, the ground unconscious, which can be thought of in different ways, and is, is a term that one finds in the Buddhist tradition, and, and, and which might be best translated with care, however, in the Christian tradition as, as God, the ultimate Reality. The, our ground unconscious is our participation in the ultimate reality, whatever that is. And as, as we've seen in, in, uh, what, in moving through these various levels, <laughs> we experience uh, the opposition the downward movement as well as the upward movement, which challenges us as we try to exercise the faculties according to their nature and, and as we try to relate to other people. So this diagram then of human nature is, 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 is our faculties, uh, insofar as these can be identified uh, by observation of, of philosophy, which is, deals only with, with the exercise of reason. Hence, it's, it's, somewhat, it, it's bound to be incomplete from the point of view of states of consciousness that, that perceive that same reality from higher levels of perception. Um, there are three essential relationships that a human being, uh, in virtue of our own personal arrival into this world, <laughs> experiences. And the first one is our uh, relationship to God, which is one of, of, of submission, acceptance, or consent. And, and thus, during the centering prayer, we are exercising in an eminent way that relationship. We're opening, surrendering, consenting to the presence of God within us. And thus, we are uh, cultivating the capacity to enter into this place of exchange or the place of encounter with the ultimate reality, which is the depth of our own being. Uh, in, in somewhere in the, uh, in the Exodus, uh, God says of Moses, in defending him against some of his detractors, I speak with Moses face to face cheek to jowl, so to speak. Well, a philosophical, perhaps, translation or interpretation of that text would say that this was a being-to-being -being conversation. That is to say, an exchange without the mediation of the senses, the emotions, or thoughts, or concepts. In other words, it's an interpenetration of spirits. So, 
this, this is the kind of relationship that is cultivated in contemplative prayer. A non-mediated and, and open openness to God so that one does not make use of concepts or particular acts during this particular time to go to God, but allows oneself to rest in the exchange of, of presences or the personal exchange of divine union. <laughs>